Hey guys, so in this video we're going to be talking about some simple machines, um, in particular pulleys, uh, the wheel and axle, and we're also going to talk a little bit about gears, we'll put an asterisk next to that one because they're not technically a simple machine, but there's enough similarities between other types of simple machines that I think they're worth talking about. First up is pulleys, and a pulley is it's pretty simple. It's just a, a wheel that can rotate freely on some axis and you have some kind of rope or belts or chain or something that's going over that wheel. And so as a simple example with just two masses on either end of the, your string, if the masses are imbalanced then you're going to have a net force and get some acceleration. This is called an Atwood machine. So there are some interesting applications for that, but I want to talk more about how to get mechanical advantage from um, using pulleys. So let's look at a diagram here. Say we have a pulley here that's connected to something rigid, a beam or a ceiling something that can't move. And then a second pulley. And this one can spin freely, but it's not rigidly attached to any other body. It can move up and down. So you can imagine as I pull on the loose end of the string here, the yellow pulley together with the, the mass that's attached to it are going to move up. If I let the string go, the yellow pulley and the mass are going to both move down. To help visualize this, I actually made a, a makeshift version um, of this diagram in real life. So if you look at this point here where the strings connected to our rigid beam. Uh, that's shown here in this video. I just drilled a hole in a piece of 2x4 and threaded the piece of orange string through there and tied it off around a piece of rebar so it can't fall back through the hole. Now this blue pulley that's rigidly attached to the beam uh, did not have two pulleys. This is actually just a caster wheel, but it works well enough, I think. Ideally, it would have a groove in it so the string wouldn't fall off. That kept happening a lot while I was trying to film this. So the string just goes over the top of this wheel and I can pull the string or let go of the string and it will just uh, move along the wheel as the, the wheel rotates. Now we have a, a free moving pulley. This is actually the same pulley that I used in my Rube Goldberg machine. As you'll notice as I pull on the string the entire pulley and the paint can it's attached to move up. Um, if I let go of the string, the entire pulley and paint can that it's attached to move down. Here's the whole system. Uh, you can see kind of both pulleys working together. You have the, the fixed pulley there attached to the 2x4 and then the, the free floating pulley that is attached to the paint can. And you can see what happens as I pull on the loose end of the string or if I let some of the, the slack and the loose end of the string go. Okay, so let's talk about some of the physics happening here. I'm applying a force to the loose end of the rope. And that tension force is the same throughout the entire length of the string. And this, that's going to be the same force that's exerted on the 2x4 by the string. So if I look at some free body diagrams, look, just look at the end of the string. I have the force that I'm pulling on it, and then the reaction force, which is the tension in the string pulling back. At the other end, I have the same thing. The string is pulling against the 2x4 with whatever force I'm pulling on it, the string with, and a tension force is opposing that. Now let's look at the entire pulley and mass assembly and come up with a free body diagram for that. 
So I have the weight of the mass, which is acting downwards, that's mass times gravity, and I have the tension force pulling up. But notice that the tension force is pulling up twice. I have the tension force on the right side of the pulley going up and on the left side of the pulley going up as so well. So what this means is, is that the force that I'm pulling on the string with is actually half the force of the weight of the object. And so this system we would say has a mechanical advantage of two. Okay, so here I'm just going to kind of draw the same diagram over the a still from a video I recorded just to, to make it explicit. You've got the 2x4 as your, your rigid body or your beam. This blue pulley here is fixed to the beam. You have a yellow pulley that is free floating that can move up and down with the paint can. And I'm applying a force to the end of the string, which is the same as the force that the string is pulling on the 2x4 with. And then there's a second tension force that's acting on that yellow pulley that's the tension of the string between the two pulleys. So notice on the right hand side and the left hand side of that yellow pulley you have tension forces acting upwards. Imagine even more complex pulley systems. So let's say we have three pulleys that are all rigidly connected to some beam and then three more pulleys that are free floating and attached to some mass. We have a string or a belt or a cable or a rope or something that's threaded through all these pulleys and is going to be free on one end and then attached to the same beam as the, those white pulleys at the other end. If I apply a force downward on the free end, that's going to be the force of the tension in my string. So now there's six tension forces that are acting upwards on my mass. I have two at, e at each of the free floating pulleys. There are two tension forces acting upwards. And then countering that, acting downwards, is the weight of my mass. And it's going to assume that it's equally distributed among all three of those pulleys. So the force acting downward at each pulley is going to be the weight divided by three. So to balance the forces at each pulley, if I have weight divided by three acting downwards and two equal tension forces acting upwards, and that means for this to be balanced, the tension force has to be the weight divided by six. Right, the weight divided by six plus the weight divided by six, the two forcing it, the two forces acting upwards has to be equal to the weight divided by three, which is the force acting downwards. Tension force that is equal and opposite to the force I'm pulling with is going to be the weight of the mass I'm lifting divided by six. So this would have a mechanical advantage of six. Fortunately, I don't have the equipment to, to demo this one, um, but just wanted to show you all how the, how the physics works and how you can use pulleys to achieve mechanical advantage. For a wheel and axle simple machine, you have some kind of flat cylindrical wheel that is attached to um, an axle. In what makes the simple machine, the, the wheel and axle simple machine, is that the wheel and the axle have to spin together. They have to be rigidly connected so that when one turns, the other turns as well. So they always have to rotate with the same angular velocity. And you can attach more than one wheel to your axle too. So let's look at an example. We'll have this purple wheel a yellow wheel. They're going to be fixed on the same axis. When one wheel spins, the other wheel spins at the same angular velocity. 
and let's give them some dimensions. Let's make this larger wheel have a radius of 0.3 meters and the smaller wheel will have a radius of 0.1 meters. The key here is the mechanical advantage we can get from a wheel and axle simple machine is always going to be proportional to the ratio of the wheel radii. So if you have watched Ms. Ruck Flynn's video um, about levers, remember that the, the key to the levers is always your, your force multiplied by the length of your lever arm. And it's a similar idea with a wheel and axle. We're looking at a force applied at the circumference of my wheel multiplied by the radius of that wheel. Again, it's just like a lever. If I, if I have a force multiplied by some lever arm length with levers that had to be conserved. So same thing with wheel and axle. The force multiplied by the wheel radius has to be conserved. So if the force of our yellow wheel times the radius of our yellow wheel has to be equal to the force at the circumference of the purple wheel times the radius of the purple wheel. Okay, so let's put some numbers into this example. Let's let the force at the yellow wheel F2 be 100 newtons. So again, that force is acting kind of perpendicular to the wheel at the circumference. And I want to know what the resulting force at the circumference of this purple wheel, the larger wheel, is going to be. So we're going to use this equation, F2 times R2 is equal to F1 times R1, I think I accidentally wrote R2 twice. The purple is, is R1. Let's just plug in some numbers. So our force at the yellow wheel is 100 newtons. The radius is 0.1 meters. And that has to be equal to the force at the purple wheel times the radius of the purple wheel. And if I solve for F1, that force, it's going to be 100 newtons times 0.1 meters divided by 0.3 meters. And so the force that's acting at the circumference of the larger wheel is 33.3 newtons. Okay, let's look at another example. Uh, this time we'll use the same, same wheel and axle assembly with the same dimensions. But now we're going to say the force is applied to the purple wheel, the larger wheel, and we'll make that a 15 Newton force. And we're going to be looking for the force that's acting at the circumference of the yellow wheel. The same equation, the force times the wheel radius has to be conserved. So F1 times R1 is equal to F2 times R2. Here, F1 is 15 newtons. R1 is 0.3 meters. F2 is unknown, that's what we're solving for, and R2 is 0.1 meters. So when I solve for force 2, the force acting at the circumference of that second wheel, the yellow wheel, it's going to be 15 newtons times 0.3 meters divided by 0.1 meters. And our answer is 45 newtons. So you can see our force got multiplied by 3. This wheel axle machine is giving us a mechanical advantage of 3. So that's really the, the gist of wheel and axle problems. You the force times the radius of the wheel has to be the same for, for every wheel that is on the axis. I also want to just throw in a, a vocab term uh, to describe this. The force acting at the circumference of the wheel times the radius of the wheel, uh, there is a, a name for that that's called torque. 
Torque is the force times the radius. So for the purple wheel, F1 times R1 is the torque of wheel 1. And for the yellow wheel, F2 times R2, that's the torque of the yellow wheel. And, and torque is going to have units of Newton times meters. And it's really important that the force has to be perpendicular to this radius. If it's not, then you, we have to do some trig to, to fill, figure out what the, what the actual torque is. So in this definition of torque, our force and that radius have to be perpendicular at 90 degree angles to each other. It isn't necessarily critical to know that this is called torque, but but now when you hear torque, you have some idea of what's being talked about.